Hi team, welcome to 10 Talks, another day's conversation all about how women win and we're figuring it out our way. We don't have the answers, but we know that we're on the journey and we'd love to hear from you as well. So Kathy, thank you for just being my partner in this journey and for our guest today, go ahead and introduce and share a bit about her and her story. Yeah, we're so excited, Taiba Hanif Park, that you've been able to join us here. You've been on a meandering journey here recently with moving from one job to another, one role to another. But Taiba is a three-time Olympian uh, in volleyball on the women's national team and an All-American at Long Beach. But more important than that, Taiba, is you have figured out a way to mesh being a mom, being an elite athlete, uh, being a successful partner, and we're exploring how women win. What do we do that's unique? What do we do that is different? And so we're here to explore that with you today. So we'd love to hear just a bit about your story, how you've really gone on this journey and most importantly, what you've learned. Um, I love that you guys are talking about just this, this topic and then transition, especially for female in females in the sporting world. And I don't know that I figured it out. <laughs> I don't know really that any of us really have, but you know, what I like to say is that I'm a student of life. Mm -hmm. I love the opportunity to learn. I love learning from other women in this capacity. And so hopefully um, I will continue to do so and hopefully be, you know, a sounding board for someone else. But I think one of the biggest things when I stepped into coaching um, in 2015, I had a three-year-old son. I had a newborn daughter. I was finishing my master's in entrepreneurship and it was just chaos. And I felt that, you know, if I had six hours here in the gym that I had to come home and give like six dedicated hours to my, my kids. And then I had to give six dedicated hours to my master's. And it was so stressful. And honestly, I think the thing that helped me the most was the NCAA Women's Coaching Academy, the We Coach Academy. And they talked about this life harmony balance and that there really is no such thing as balance. And I've kind of held on to that because, you know, balance looks like equal times wherever you are. It's that 50-50. And if you tip the scale a little bit, then, you know, you're going to fall or something's not going to work out. But harmony looks like this ebb and this flow, this push and pull, and it allows you to be present in that moment, knowing that there are different seasons of life. And so now that I've been juggling this around a lot, you know, I know that in season it's going to get really, really hectic. And I know that I've got to help have help with my kids, or I know that, you know, my personal life may kind of take a back road. But then I know that when season's over, that I'm really focusing on those other aspects. And I'm kind of, you know, putting volleyball and my, my student athletes kind of into that background. And so again, that ebbs and flows and just knowing that there's a harmony for each and every season that we go through. So I'm not a parent, Taiba, but you and Carlette both are. And so can you give us an example? Can you raise children on this kind of a schedule where I'm available now and now I'm not available and then I'll be available later? How does that work? Um, again, you know, my kids are at the age where they can understand a little bit now. And so they're 12 and eight, but we have started having this conversation with them when they were younger. Uh, there are times and there are events that mommy's going to miss and, you know, maybe the first portion of season or during your class, but in the back half of the, you know, second semester, I'll be there for everything. I'll be there for your pickups and your drop-offs and I'll be making lunch for you and breakfast and, you know, really diving into making special moments where they know that I'm there and I'm present and almost going a little bit overboard so that those times when I'm away, it's, well, remember those good times and remember when I'm there and you still have me when I come home. Like we're still gonna, we make sure we have our dedicated, you know, we have our quiet time or still the book in bed, whatever days that I'm home, but it's making sure that when I am there and I'm around them that I'm present. And it's saying, I might need to go take a call for 20 minutes but I'm going to come back to you, or there is something important that I really have to go step aside for, but I will be back to you. And so they always know that it's like, oh, she's gone. And I'm just kind of here and I'm by myself. It's mommy's always coming back. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm a little bit ahead of you. My little women are almost 40, so 39, 38, and 22. So I can say it works. I mean, I don't know, maybe the therapy bills and things will be coming later. So maybe I, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to claim it from my perspective. But what was really valuable for me is that they were on the journey with me. They were very engaged and I was truthful about it. I mean, you know, there were times when I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. I really need your help. And I found that to be a huge gift for us now as my little women are much older. I see that they live the same way that I modeled for them. Pretty much that's what they grew up. That's what they knew in their house. And most importantly, it brought me great joy. Like I love what I do. So I, I made it intentional about do what you love and we as a family will always support you. Versus if you're going to do it and we're all going to be miserable, we're definitely going to figure something else out, you know? So Kathy, that's one reason you and I are so intentional about this is that we want women to have that ability to say, no, I want to go for this. Just how do I do it? And I found certainly it's a matter of sharing my heart and my truth and being able to say, I really want this. Will you help me? And now, you know, there's no better group than women to be like, you need something, we are on this. And I think so many times as women, we take ourselves out of that and pretend as if we don't need it. And, you know, I've got this. And boy, for me, the more I can get help and the more I can engage the people that are in my life, we then feel the, the joy of doing it together. Absolutely. And I love that you said that because I think it's about inviting them into the process. Mm -hmm. You know, my kids are welcome in my office. They're at school right now. But, it, you know, if I'm sometimes if I'm on a Zoom call, it's not the panic. Hey, I'm on a Zoom call. Get away. It's, you know, come see what I'm doing real mm -hmm. fast. And then, you know, I'll be there in 10 mm -hmm. minutes or, you know, any position that I take, I make sure that they know that my kids are a priority as well and that they will be in the gym, they will be next to me and that I need to create a safe space for them as well. And so invite them into the process. And again, like I said, I think everyone has a little bit more joy when they feel their guard is let down and you can be comfortable with your surroundings. So you took a new job here as the assistant coach at Oregon, Power Five, big pressure job um, with a, a major volleyball program. What were, give us, what were some of the conversations that you had in evaluating this, uh, both with the head coach, Matt Almer, and then also within your own family? Um, you know, I think Matt went above and beyond what I needed. And again, my first conversation is I'm interested in this, but it cannot work unless I feel that my kids' needs are met. And so one, my son is on an IEP. And so it's, you know, what do the schools look like out there? What is that support system? And he went and he, you know, the, the district called me. <laughs> he yes. stepped out and said, hey, can, I know a family friend has a son on IEP. They came and talked to me. They had a district reach out. They talked to me. Um, you know, he made sure that, you know, we are in the office um, in the morning because he has children. Our associate head coach, Erica uh, Dillard, has three children. And so it's, I don't care if you're in the office or you're working for home, as long as you're getting that work done. So one, you know, throw that out of the bag. You don't have to worry about your kids. Um, two, it's, you can design your workspace however you want. You know, they all have kids. And so, you know, their kids are in the gym all the time. Our managers love our kids and they're often babysitting or, you know, they're taking care of them. And so um, it's a very, very supportive environment. Um, Matt and Erica actually live on the same street. <laughs> and so they know a lot of the same people and same neighborhood. And they said, we've got a built-in community for you right here. And so we wanna alleviate some of that stress of going somewhere where you don't know anyone, your kids don't have any friends. We have that all for you laid out. And so I think it was a very um, seamless transition for me in that part because I've built a really good support system for my kids here being that my husband is overseas 85 days at a time. So I need that. And uh, he went out of his way to create that for me. Huge gift. Yes. So, yeah. And so how did you ask for what you need? Um, I think it was just very upfront. Again, now that I'm a little bit later in life, you know, I don't want to play games. I don't want to waste anybody's time. I know that time is probably my most valuable resource commodity. And um, 
I want people to respect it and I want to respect other people's times. And so it's gotta be the right situation. Um, and so I was very upfront of, you know, I, I need the right school. I need, you know, to live in the right neighborhood. So I have the right school. I need the support system, not only for myself, but for my children. Um, I need to be flexible with the work schedule that allows me to maybe come in later some days or, you know, leave early some days, depending on um, what the situation looks like. But, you know, my, my, top four things were all about my family and my kids. And then we got to the rest of it of, you know, all right, all right, what's the, you know, what's the salary going to be or you know, what are the perks and all of that. But my top four things, can we figure out my kids? When you've gone for these things before, have you asked for your top four things and not gotten them? And then what did you do with it? Um, I don't think I even got to the point where I felt like I was in a position or secure, confident within myself to even ask for them because it was, I'm just stepping into this and I kind of want to take whatever I can get. I don't want to ruffle feathers right away. And so I'm going to step into this conversation and hopefully it will all work out when I get there. And sometimes it did and sometimes it really didn't. And again, just being able to respect my time and respect somebody else's time, you know, here we are and we kind of wasted a year or two years where it just wasn't the right fit. That's what I'm curious about for women is that so many times they feel like, well, you know, I don't want to appear arrogant and I don't want to be asking for too much. And yet we need to set ourselves up for success according to our definition. And you explained it beautifully according to your family needs. So what would you say to the younger version of, you know, women coming up that you really have these words of wisdom? How would you give it to them in a way that still is wrapped in that that space of you do have to make sacrifices and you do have to do some things in the beginning of your career. You know, I I think that there is a cost to everything, to to everything that we do. And so I think it's looking at the cost of benefits and what things are you willing to give up and what are you not, you know, establishing what are those non-negotiables? Everybody has them. Mm -hmm. And I think once you establish them and once you're confident with them, then you can kind of, you're more educated when you go into um, that hiring process. But also knowing that this is a non-negotiable right now in my life, and maybe two years, it might not be, or two years ago, this wasn't. And so that they're going to change a little bit depending on where you are. And you know, maybe I'm willing to negotiate at my hours in my in in the gym right now, let's say, because I know that it's going to set me up for success and I can lay my my groundwork. And then in a couple of years, well, now I've got that family time back or, you know, may, maybe it's something else. But I think ultimately it's deciding what are your non-negotiables and what environment actually fits into that. Who who is the employer? Who are the employers that are going to allow you to actually stay consistent with those? And did you have to go beyond um, the head coach uh, for that? I mean, in other words, you're in an assistance role. And so it's really was Matt Ulmer, the head coach negotiating with you. Are there things also that the university needed to weigh in on? Are there some examples of things that you ask from them? Um, you know, it, it did go a little bit beyond in that um, I do have some plane tickets, you know, so the kids are able to travel with me to a Pac-12 or um, if we go to a, um, if we go postseason, then family is able to come to that as well. And so there's some things that were beyond Coach Ulmer and that went more up into, you know, our SWA and athletic director that said, hey, we understand. And again, I think primarily from working with Matt and Erica already that, you know, family is very important here at Oregon and we want to make sure that's reflected in even our contracts. And so here are some things that we've done for other coaches as well. Love that as a winning strategy, right? The power of team, everybody being for you and setting you up and in such an empowering way. I want to talk about you as an athlete and really, you know, what did you discover on your journey as a young woman that has really anchored you in the confidence that you have now? I think the biggest thing that I talk about um, with my own kids, um, with other kids when I go out is don't let somebody else's limiting beliefs become your reality. Mm -hmm. And so even as a two-time Olympian already, you know, I fought 
extremely hard to make my third Olympics. At that time, um, I had never taken a summer away from USA and I decided to. And during that time I got pregnant with my son. I thought it would be the perfect time. I had about a year and a half, two years to get back in shape. And it wasn't an easy process coming back into the gym. And I was kind of counted out and you know thrown to the side. It wasn't A or B side, it was like, Z X Y Z court you know, way up in the corner. And, you know, we didn't have a coach sometimes we didn't have a practice plan, but I wasn't going to let them stop me. I wasn't going to let their limiting beliefs of, you know, you, you just had a child, you're a little bit out of shape. You know, you haven't been here for a couple of years and we're not sure if you're quite right for this team. Stop me because I knew that I could. And I wanted to be in that gym to prove to myself and everyone else that I could. And it was, if I'm here and I'm working and I, see that somebody else deserves that spot and they can beat me out, then I can walk away with my head held high, but I'm going to fight and fight and fight until I absolutely know that. And there was never that point that I didn't feel that I could compete. And so I stuck with it and I showed up day after day after day and I stopped competing for, I've got to impress my coaches, but I started competing for myself. And I think that's when that change happened and the coaches noticed and my teammates noticed, and I started to make a couple of teams. And the teams that I made were the ones that qualified for the Olympics and went to the Olympics and, you know, the two that matter. <laughs> and so It was never stopped. I never stopped believing in my own reality. If I know that I can do this and I know that I can be an Olympian after giving birth to my son. What gave you the courage? I mean, how did you know that? Um, you know, because doubt is, from many of the conversations we've had with others is doubt is an ever present factor for many women how did you know that you belong there and that you could do this and what did you do when you didn't know it um for me I think it was so ingrained I I, I decided I was going to be an Olympian at five watching the 1984 Olympics and I just knew with a passion that it was going to be something that I was going to follow until I couldn't follow anymore and it wasn't at the point where I was injured. I wasn't at the point where everyone else was playing so much above me. And so I don't think I had that doubt because um, the passion was still there. The dream was still there. Uh, I still had the resources to be there. And I think most importantly, I would rather try and fail than not try at all. Yeah. That regret and, 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 you know, and I, there was a lot of guilt in the beginning of, I have this beautiful new baby and I should be loving this moment, staying at home with him. I'm married. I've never been in the same house with my husband for more than two weeks, you know, just, and I, and I want to leave that. I, I want to go play again, but it's, I need to know, I want to know rather than saying, you know, five years from now, man, I could have, I should have. And so, you know, the, the will to win was much more than that that cost factor again we talked about mm -hmm. i just value so much you owning your drive so many times with women we feel like we are supposed to or we should be happy staying home or we need this or we need that all those voices whoever they're talking to us how did you really stay clear and focused on you while you did honor being a mother and a partner it definitely wasn't easy. <laughs> there were many, many days where I think, you know, the ugly cry where <laughs> the tears are falling, but the voice, nothing's really coming out. And, you know, it was a lot of soul searching, but I do believe in journaling and writing down. And so, you know, I was able to say that even on a bad day, you know, I could go back and look and say, but wow, look at where you've come and look at what you've done. Look at this progress. And again, I knew that it was a hard road. And luckily I had Danielle Scott, who was in that process with me alongside of me as she had just given birth as well. And it is, it's kind of that we've gotta be the ones to create this path and hasn't been done so much before us. We saw Robin and Mo go through it and you know it was incredible, but we hadn't seen it in a while. And so let's be the ones, let's be the warriors, let's show them. I'm not gonna let you count me out just because I was pregnant. And so I think that was always in the back of my mind. Has your experience as an African-American woman shaped how you approach this? Um, maybe a little bit, I think, you know, 
How? It's it's different when you walk into a gym and I grew up in Orange County. And so, um, you know, a lot of, there, there weren't a lot of minority faces. I think I was one of <laughs> maybe the one in a lot mm-hmm. of the places I went. And so um, not having anyone understand you, not have anyone look like you, not have anyone to just share uh, and bounce just your thoughts and feelings off of and you know what you're going through and so um, to be able to be someone who was continuing to rise up the USA ladder I felt like I needed to I was rep- representing much more than just my family I was representing all the little you know um, underserved communities the black and brown women that were out there playing and so I, I felt like the the higher we could climb the more opportunity we were giving for them. And so was that toughness something that you had dealt with experientially so much of the time coming up that it served you when it was time to have somebody say, hey, you're on court number Z here and here's where the, here's where the folks we think are going to be Olympians are going to be. Yeah. And, you and know, did that, had you had kind of that training of being the other and the outsider already? Absolutely. And, you know, I like to tell people that my superpower is being a volleyball player, because as a volleyball player, I mean, you get hit, you knock down, you fall on the floor, and you got to bounce back right, right up right away. And, you know, you've got to be ready for the next play. And, you know, just, you know, talking about the racial factor and growing up in Orange County, I think when I was just about sixth grade, seventh grade, um, we had my parents bought a new house. Uh, We were actually in closing and my mom went to go look at the house and um, the seller was there and noticed that my mom was a black woman and said, you know, we don't want to sell. We don't want to sell to them anymore. And it became this whole thing. And so, you know, we ended up, it was, my mom took him to court. It was uh, a long drawn out lawsuit when within that time, my parents had to file for bankruptcy to just pay for cost and all of that. And so I, I, you know, I think I felt different at a young age of like, man, is this how the world sees me? And this is what's going to happen. But, you know, it took a lot of willpower for my mom and dad to keep going and they lost everything. They filed bankruptcy, but they kept at it to kind of prove a point and to say, no, we are here and we deserve to be here. and We're going to fight for this. And in the end they did. And, and they won at that time. We didn't have money to keep the house, but it was, it was more of we're putting a stamp on this right now. Like we won and we are going to be here and I'm going to show my kids that we deserve to be here. And so that has kind of always carried with me. So for women who are listening and they maybe have been a head coach or they've been in a coaching position and, you know, there's a lot of change happening right now. Some administrations are doing well, some are cutting back. There's just a lot happening as we all find our footing in kind of this new way of doing things. What words of wisdom would you say to a coach who's considering, should I get out of coaching because maybe I'm struggling and not being able to have the support that I need and go get another job doing something else because I can take care of my family. I won't be working all the time. I might not be as stressed. On your journey, what would your words of wisdom be to that person? Um, I would say to hopefully find the passion within them again and that we need them. We really do. And I think COVID brought on an unfortunate situation where a lot of coaches at many different levels were kind of forced to give up their game um, and be home. But we have far too many qualified women that are leaving the game because of situations brought on by COVID or family. And we really, really need them. It's unfortunate that, you know, when now we've got a gold medal behind us in USA, but we need responsible, qualified female coaches as inspirations for the hundreds of thousands of young athletes that are there. And, you know, they are a light, they are a guiding light for a lot of these young athletes. So, you know, I, I hope they can find the passion within them. I hope that they can find a moment where their family fits in And even if it's stepping back in some responsibilities and delegating more responsibilities to someone else that they can find a way to stay within the game. And what about for the athlete? What about for the athlete that says, you know what, I don't know if I can do this anymore because I'm not on the A side and I'm embarrassed from a social media perspective or my parents are really, you know, banking on me needing doing this. And so there's so many voices that are tugging on our young women as well. What words of wisdom do you have for them? 
I think one of my favorite quotes to some, to, it's not going to be perfect, but it's Louisa May Alcott. And it says, you know, far away are um, in the distance are my highest aspirations. I may not get there, but I will follow where they may lead. And I think that's kind of what they have to, what they have to find within themselves. Um, I think there's always going to be ups and downs in our road and our journey. And every season's a little bit different as we talked about. And so knowing that even if they are in a season that's a little bit rough, that there is a way that's going to be better. There's a new chapter. Each day brings a new opportunity. And so to continue to see the positive, continue to see the light. And um, I think reach out. Mm -hmm. I think before we're taught as athletes that it's, you, you have to play through pain and you have to hold it in. And we're now in an era where it's okay to not be okay. And so if it gets to be too tough, then reach out for help. It's okay to be not okay. And yeah. you know, find the people around you that can support you and guide you and help you make that decision versus just taking it all on internally. That is such a gift because I feel like that is one of our winning strategies for how women win is to ask for help really receive it. It's a, a place of, of strength, not weakness. And so how have you done that when you have been in your situations that haven't been fabulous for you, or you've had that ugly cry and you've had those moments? How did you reach out for help? I had to learn how. I, I was definitely that person that kept it all bottled in until it was too much. Um, and so again, I had to learn how to just be present and take one day at a time. And in doing that, it meant, okay, call mom. <laughs> mom always has some wise <laughs> advice. You know, I called mom. I had a few coaches that I really trusted, you know, a, a Debbie Green and even Brian Gemolaro, um, um, Dietra Collins, uh, Michelle Chapman Smith, you know, just some females who are in the same atmosphere and uh, just know the, the push and pull of it all. And, and you say, hey, have you, have you ever been here? And how did you get out of here? Or what's next? Like, I'm, I'm kind of stuck where I am right now. So what is next? Knowing that like, we teach our athletes that, you know, sometimes you have to be uncomfortable. But right mm -hmm. now, I'm a little bit uncomfortable. So what does it look like on that next phase or that next chapter so that I can kind of start to prepare my mind and know that there is something else beyond the hole that I'm in right now? Good stuff, Taiba. Really good words of wisdom and your your experience of yeah of going through the wormhole, not asking for what you want, then recognizing that that's the way. That's the key to success. I think are some good words of wisdom. And yes, you you've obviously lived it um, through some of the difficulties that you've grown up with with your parents, and then um, that you've experienced yourself. So thank you very much. Thank you guys again. I'm I'm so glad you're talking about this. I I think we all should have more conversations about it. And far too many athletes, talented athletes, leaving the game. Far too many coaches leaving the game. And we really just have to be a support system for one another. Yeah, we so want to be there for each other. And just one other question. When you call mom, what do you want moms to share? So when you've got an athlete who's struggling because they're not getting playing time or it's not going their way and they call mom, any moms listening, what, what do you want the moms to be able to share? Um, I think it starts even before that and having that a good enough relationship to know the things that you can talk about and the things that you can't. And so I think it goes back to that mom that takes her daughter to a tournament um, and they say, well, what are the three things that you're working on this tournament? And where do you wanna be? And so at the end of that tournament, it is, we're talking about those three things and those three things only, unless you bring it up to me. And I'm not gonna pressure you about any other situation, but it might just be a reminder of, hey, you know, you said you were gonna work on this today, how are you feeling? And so that relationship with the mom of, you know, you've been working on this, where are you? Or you ask for support in this, are you getting that? And how can I help you? Or what are some things, what is your next step? And how can I get you to that next step? And so it's supporting them without, well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. It's keeping a very positive light on that conversation. And is that the way your mom dealt with you? She did. Yes, yeah, she did. And, you know, it was always, God's never going to give you more than you can handle. <laughs> and so, you know, let's talk about where you are and what are the feelings that are coming up versus keeping it bottled in. And what do you think you need to do in order to get to that next step? It was never, 
oh, let's bitch and complain about it. It is, you actually realize where you are. So let's talk about where you need to go to get out of this spot. Great words of wisdom for all of us as we think about, okay, where are we and what do we want to do to achieve whatever it is that matters to us? So thank you so much for today's conversation and just the joy of being on this journey. Kathy, such a gift to have you, you know, discovering this with us and love the pieces of information that we're getting with all of our guests. So thank you. And team, it's up to you. Go out and win your way. We'd love to hear from you. Go to howwomenwin.com and figure out how you want to win. Thank you both. Thank you.